Hi, this is Eric Stromquist. Welcome to Control Talk. Now, your Smart Buildings video casting podcast for the week ending February 26, 2017. This is episode 216, where we talk about all things smart buildings and smart controls and HVAC controls. And I am joined by the man, the myth, the legend, who uh, we think had a run in with Kevin Fascinelli from Dykin. We're not sure. Kenny, welcome to the show and tell us what happened with your eye, big dog. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm physically and mentally challenged today. I, I played paddle tennis. As you know, I, I, it's a very close uh, related game to tennis. You know, it's uh, it's great. It's a wintertime sport. The season starts in October and ends in uh, late February. Uh, in fact, we just we won our league. We were Division Eight winners, so we're all congratulations, man. Well, it's just a lot of fun, and it's a bunch of guys, and it's uh, it's a, a Tuesday and Thursday type thing. So you get a nice little rhythm going. So we're playing. It was about eight thirty, and uh, I was going after a shot, and I, I swung, and it was coming close to the fence. Then you know the ball caroons off my paddle right into my eye and had some very serious uh, issues uh possible retina detachment i go oh, again tomorrow man. so i spent all thursday my wife and i my nurse rita my wife took me to the hospital and, and stood there and went from one emergency room to another one so it was uh, started at about 9 15 ended at about 4 30 a.m then I had to go back to another appointment at one o'clock Damn. on friday so uh, it's been a very you know just nuts I, I i was having a good time just trying to get in shape and then this uh, setback happens but uh i'm real concerned about the um uh, your eyes are very sensitive uh organ and uh it takes a big jolt uh the ball is uh, you know just a little bit bigger than a racquetball and it just is, is, it, is it hard like a racquetball too kenny no no it's uh it, well it's 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 about the same dent you know uh, same you density push it. Yeah, it, oh, it's nothing man. like a baseball or a softball. Anything. So, it, it, and that's the problem is it gives. So it goes in there and it sponges in and it just kind of took a layer of uh, my eye surface of my eye damaged a little bit. So, but no cornea scratches. Just, just uh, well, there were scratches, but no, no, uh, nothing serious on the outside. It's the inside. The retina got uh, disturbed or traumatized and some bruising and bleeding. So anyhow, I don't talk too much about it. It's just I have to wear this because it blocks the light and uh, it's not very pretty, but uh, it's very effective as far as I. I don't want to the light right now. I'm taking this pupil stuff to make my pupil uh, stay enlarged so it doesn't stick. The swelling it could start to uh, settle and then it sticks to the back of the retina and it causes the retina to tear even more. So taking the special medicine and steroids and stuff and, and pain pills. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I tell you what, man, it'll be kind of reminiscence back at Studio 54 if you're taking the pain pills, right? We call this the uh, the Pirate Studio 54 episode. But uh, well, I tell you what, Kenny, I tell you what, we got a good show this week. I got a great guest coming on a little bit but uh why don't we take care of a little bit bit of business from uh, control well, sure. trends last week uh well, well, we, well first i want to give you a compliment uh, you worked uh, people to understand where uh you know they're sleeping at night you're you're doing film editing and it's a real time consuming labor of love each each time you do one it, whether it's two minutes or four minutes or some of them seven minutes that is uh it just inhales time hours and, and so i get to hear you before you start <laughs> and when you end and, and then but uh, so what we'll be handling a lot of the, the videos. That, uh, so again, this is the uh, the harvest. Uh, we get a lot of social media, social uh, you know marketing collateral that are very important to some of our vendors and, and the people in the industry because they get a chance to see themselves and how they look like when they're rock and rolling on Hollywood stage there at the Hard Rock Cafe in Las Vegas. I mean, just amazing video footage. Uh, but we, we have hey, some hang on real quick. Let me hop in real quick, Kenny, because you just said something that I need to apologize to our audience about regarding social media. I have not been on LinkedIn for about two and a half months, and I just went on this morning before the show, and a bunch of people had tried to contact me, so I apologize uh, in advance. I get too many emails, so like LinkedIn, I just hadn't been on in a long time, so I apologize about that. I know we have people that uh, that reach out to us and try to contact us, us through control trends, and we're, we're not good at getting back to them, and you know, part of that is because this is... Like Kenny said, this is not our day job. Ken and I both work full-time jobs here in the day, and we're kind of doing this at night. So apologize in advance for anybody that sort of reached out to us and we haven't gotten back to them, and especially for the people on LinkedIn. Um, again, apologies. But I, I just, if, if I managed all the social media stuff and emails, that's all I'd do. All right. Enough said. Uh, no, I, so the bread and butter stuff, let's just cover a couple of things. Uh, the PC World's the seven security threats to technology that scare experts the most, ransomwares, just the beginning. Now, this is a you know a typical cybersecurity post 
but it's not. Uh, this was very interesting. I thought the control trends community needed the, the benefit of reading about this because of the actual documented, uh, you know, bad actors and what they're doing. You know, and it says, what happens if a bad actor turns off your heat in the middle of winter and then demands one thousand dollars to turn it back on, or holds a small city's power, uh, you know, source or, or power production plants for ransom? Uh, so these kinds of attacks are now going. That used to be personal, corporate, and infrastructure technology. We're now coming into, uh, you know, uh, challenges on equipment. So the operation technology that we know from uh, Fred Gordy and, and the difference between in IT, in, in, you know, information technology and operational technology that turns things off and on and controls elevators and whatever, that's an entirely different ballgame. But now we're seeing that uh, if you have a smart thermostat, you could be prone to one of these uh, ugly seven. So, because uh, they talk, they go right into saying about your smart thermostat and about your, um, uh, they say about, you know, so an Australian hot hotel has been hacked, uh, and they're, they're concerned that this, these attacks could eventually migrate to your home. Uh, and it says about your, your thermostat. So you need to make sure that as smart as you make your house, you know, with all the uh, intelligent garage doors, intelligent lighting, and the IoT of things inside your house, that those are access points that uh, the, the, the bad players, they call them, can come in there and, and take over your house and then hold you for ransom so that you can't open your garage door unless you pay them their uh, their money. <laughs> I, I'm kind of I'm 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 digging that, Kenny. I've been watching this pirate show called Black Sails, uh, which is just an awesome show about pilot, pirates and NASA and how that all changed. I'm kind of thinking these might be the modern day pirates. And again, th special thanks to Fred Gordy. I mean, he's always on top of things. Uh, but but so how would you protect your thermostat, Kenny? Does, does... They say that uh, all your smart home gadgets have passwords and somebody uh, there's a perception when you walk in the door that you're in some shroud of security so the the common elements that you would use to protect your stuff at work or anywhere else professionally you need to also do per, you know personally not just your bank accounts but now they're saying so change your default password number one thing to do uh, you can also take further steps to insulate your connect devices by disabling remote access using a separate dedicated home LAN for iot devices as well as a dedicated cloud account for controlling them well, and then I think I think the other thing you got to be real aware of too, especially if you're doing the thermostats. And I'm going to give you my tip right now and see if you like this one. I'm sure Fred Gordy would get this. So, with all the passwords, it's just real simple. Just make your password for your thermostat like Ken's thermostat, right, or Eric's <laughs> thermostat, because he'll never figure that one out. <laughs> well, you know what? I was uh, I watched this uh, thing now with um, what movie was it? Um, Robot, Mr. Robot. Oh Have yeah, Mr. Robot. One? Yeah, yeah, that's oh, an awesome geez. show. Yeah. If they want you, baby, you're, you're, you're had. No, I'm kidding. That's, that's not a good attitude to have. But it just showed how this guy had these uh, incredible uh, programs that if something took longer than 30 minutes, you know, it was government level. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Military grade, you know. Okay, well, that was uh, that was our first post there, Eric. And then uh, we start the video series that uh, – why don't you tell us about the – on the red carpet with the 2016 Control Trends Awards, our building automation Hollywood, uh, you know, people, our, our pretty faces, our intelligent faces, our, our technology manifested through faces, which I think is the most important thing that the Control Trends uh, really does is puts people's faces to those great, you know, services that are just taken for granted. So tell us about the on the carpet with the red uh, with the 2016 Control Trends Awards in Las Vegas. Well, you know, as we try to make the Control Trends Awards, like we said before, the Hollywood moment for the people in our industry, our sort of glamorous event, if you will. And what would a glamorous event be like? Can you imagine the Academy Awards or the Grammys without a red carpet? So it's a great opportunity for people to uh, to sort of come out and, and be, get dressed up and be seen. And of course, I ham it up big time, you know. Uh, and it's just kind of cool to see people like uh, Johan Chakarad and Mike Marshall from Easy Eye when they get all dressed up. Of course, all the beautiful women we have in our industry. So it's, 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 just, it's a great experience. And, and I think the biggest compliment, Kenny, that I've ever gotten regarding the Control Trends Awards, I think this is sort of at the heart of it, is I've had a couple of times where, you know, people that have been around the industry for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, you know, they'll get a red carpet interview or they'll win an award and they're, uh, they'll call me up and they'll say, Hey man, I showed my wife and kids this video. They actually think I'm cool now. So that's, uh, that's a big piece of it. Right. I mean, you know, you know, it's, it's, we deserve it. I mean, let's, you know, face it. I mean, it, you know, if, if, if we don't have this, what do we have? And so it's, it's a lot of fun. I think this year's event, uh, really sort of hit on all cylinders, if you will. We had our biggest crowd ever, 
Um, and so the red carpet was a lot of fun. It, it, it was good times. And next year, the Control Trans Awards, if you want to be on the red carpet, all you got to do is come up and your game show host, Controls Guy here, will get you on the red carpet. <laughs> well, I, I, again, I, I've watched this uh, so many times. Uh, talk about hamming it up. Who's this? What's this? Explain that. Oh, that was, uh, hang on. Jen, Jenny Stentz and Gina Elliott yeah. and Eric Stromquist with yeah. the Las Vegas behind him. That's that it. looks like you guys are having a lot of fun. Oh, we were was having a lot, of, a lot fun? of fun. Yeah. So I apologize to uh, Jenny and, and, uh, and Gina in advance. I could have put them both in a headlock, but, uh, but Hey, you know, that's called I, captivating your audience. Right? Yes. I can't, I can't say that I actually think a lot about any of this stuff is premeditated. Uh, you know, Kenny will tell you that I'm very spontaneous. And if you listen to the show or watch the show, uh, you kind of know that there's not a lot necessarily a lot of thought that goes into what I do. So sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But uh, but, you know, what great people, Jenny Stentz from JCI and Jeannie Elliott from uh, Snyder Electric. And they actually presented the 2016 Control Trends Woman of the Year. They did a fantastic job with that. And both are just formidable, formidable forces in their own right. And to get to interview them at the same time was awesome. And it looks well, like anyway, you got the Hauk boys well, up there. Yeah, because it wasn't just it wasn't just the factory folks, because, I mean, we know that Jenny Stentz is the vice president at Johnson, and Gina Elliott is the vice president of marketing, I believe, at Schneider Electric. But here's guys, these are the contractors of the year from last year, and these yeah. are two brightest guys, uh, sharpest knives in the drawer, uh, Ted and his son Jason. Uh, Jason Hauk is probably one of the best master systems integrators in the business, so uh, they were really excited. And uh, tell us about the some of the other folks that you interviewed i'll try to get well you know it was it was cool because uh you know uh, huey huenton from functional devices was there i got to interview amy dorn from Allerton. Uh, of course ted and and jason uh, i'm trying to think of some of the other ones there it was uh, kind of a, a veritable who's who and it was so crowded that not everybody got a chance to come through uh, unfortunately we didn't give our friends from honeywell through Distech couldn't make it through kmc couldn't make it through but uh but it was it was just a great group of people, and uh, yeah, check the video out. It's kind of funny. Um, um, there's uh, there's a good one there. That's, oh, uh, Sarah, Sarah Montalini. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's Scott Cross. Uh, let's go back and see Sarah. She won the uh, P Talk Award. The P Talk Award, which is uh, a spectacular thing. Uh, there's a gentleman from Johnson Controls. Who's that? That's Dan Preston from JCI. Yeah, he's right. giving me a hard time about this New England Patriots going to beat up on our Falcons. So I thought about <laughs> just deleting him for that, but uh, but Dan's <laughs> such a good guy, I couldn't do that. So and there's Scott Cross, our man from uh, Temperature yeah. Controls out of Dallas, Texas. So it was a good good group. And of course, Roger Rebenak made his presence known, which is always great. He does great red carpet interviews. Well, it's just there's so many, but uh, please visit this. And uh, like I said, I've watched this. Uh, I just, you know, it's just, this is the uh, cream. Uh, this is the fun. This is the, uh, this is the good time uh, that we, we w look forward to. And it's all captured video. You know, the, so I think the generating the, um, the marketing collateral uh, and to put the documentation, who the, uh, the, the champions were, who the, who the people in the business were in the year 2016, this is a great video that captures it. And again, this is the impetus and the motivation for 2017 for everybody that's involved. Uh, this is the, uh, you know, this is, this is the capture. This is where yeah. you, you, 10 years from now, you can look back at this and, and look at uh, almost like a reunion type thing of, uh, you know, cause this, this captures all the, the VIPs, the executives, uh, the, technical folks that uh, came up with the solutions that made your life easier. Uh, the people that put the business in, uh, you know, we had some great contractors here from around the, uh, around, around the, around the world. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I tell you what, our industry really cleans up good. I mean, you know, look, look, you know, Scott Cross looks like a million bucks all dressed up here. So uh, our industry cleans up good. There's Huey and his wife right behind right. you uh, from functional, functional devices. devices. Yeah. yeah. They won, uh, they won an award. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, I just, again, so you get to see, uh, you know, humanizes our industry and, and puts faces behind uh, the places, you know. Well it, well, it does. And Kenny, and then what we're trying to do, because we also covered AHR while we were out there, the AHR show. So we're trying to mix in a blend of Control Trends highlights videos with, uh, you know, sort of meat and potatoes, AHR. And you got to catch up with Larry Weber from Honeywell in our next post. And tell us about your conversation with Larry and Roger Rebin at Honeywell Booth. Well, I did, uh, you know, and, and uh, we've, uh, we've seen some great technology being deployed this year at the 2017 AHR, uh, you know, and we'll, we'll cover some more of it, uh, with the acuity and Distech, and, uh, we'll see, uh, KMC has some great stuff and, uh, well, Honeywell, uh, finally, uh, let loose, uh, their light, uh, commercial. Uh, and this to me, uh, let me get that up real quick because, um, I, I think Larry Weber, uh, is a very eloquent, uh, CEO. He's, uh, he's, he's a, He's a smart guy. He came, uh, from the technical track. He knows what he's talking about. And he, 
thought this is one of the most important things Honeywell's done in quite a while because they're going to make technology available to a whole new subset of contractors, commercial contractors, even residential contractors, because it's very difficult to uh, you know do things well all the time. And uh, in, in sometimes to get started, the investments needed, the, the web hosting services, you know, getting a website started, it's beyond the scope of, 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 of the majority of uh, light commercial contractors. So if you provide them that solution, if you give them a solution uh, where it takes this many steps, you know, five easy steps, you're uh, in a web hosted environment, you can now focus on your job of providing good service uh, work to equipment, good customer relationships, and you can build on that. So you can take care of first things first, that's heating and cooling, efficiencies, then you can get into comfort control. Then you can start talking about lighting and whatever, but you need access to the tools to do that. And this, uh, so Larry was very excited about what the Honeywell is offering the um, the new the, the contractors that uh, you know are not presently signed up with the DDC system, that are not presently uh after that, 80% of our market is in the light commercial space. AKA so need- the race to the small space. That, exactly. You know, that Honeywell so- invented that back in the day, uh, and then we all got big, and now they're coming back into it. So, yeah, I think it's democratization of con- de- democratization. I say that Democratize- word. Right? Democratization. Right? Democra- yep. Yeah, of, of controls. And, uh, and I think that 80% of the market is, is right there. So I think that's going to be a really good thing. And you're right. Larry is a, a very eloquent speaker, very, very, um, you know, well-informed executive, really gets his research down. I always like listening to him what he has to say because he's spot on and he backs it up with data. So, uh, Well, and here it is. Here's the uh, LCBS Connect. Uh, first of all, Honeywell's position in, in the HR, they had a great spot. And I mean, this was the biggest show I've seen and I've gone to a bunch of them. You know, I mean, I've gone to probably, let's see, it's a... Probably like, I don't know, 16, 17 of these things. And and uh, I don't ever remember bumping into people walking down the aisles and people having 30 or 40 attendees standing around a presentation. They had some really neat formats. You know, they had professional presenters out there, just like the old days. It reminded me of like, uh, you know, in the Wild Wild West where they were selling elixirs, you know, out of the back of a stagecoach. These had these people in these elevated you know positions with chairs out there to an audience and they were filled up and you had to wait 40 minutes to the next one. Uh, you had vice presidents, you had executives of every, uh, you know, from every level uh, or every organization had like uh, the um, technical presentations they had uh, you know overviews from the ceo uh johnson had an amazing uh, presentation in the press corps was there you know so i got uh, as uh, being part of the uh, control trends and being a media uh participant we got invited to a very interesting presentation by johnson it's going to show the whole world what well, larry weber did the same thing honeywell had this incredible booth and in there they just dis- they did showed honeywell's technology and the new stuff and this this here this lcbs connect is going to give your not so prodigious contractors an opportunity at at the uh, technologies that eluded them because they didn't have the ability to invest they didn't have a separate person go get trained on this school and they don't have the money to invest in software at that level but they can get started now so this gives you IoT web connected enabled control systems at the lowest level for zoning for good, you know, 5,000, 12,000, 15,000 square feet. Even residential uh, homes, uh, you know, can take advantage of this technology now and really maximize your uh, the IoT advantages. Very cool, Kenny. Well, listen, our guest is on the other computer waiting, so let's bring her on right now. All right, Kenny Smyers, I tell you what, we got our girl from the Valley, Therese Sullivan, one of our favorites. If you're not checking her out, you're missing out. She does the blog, buildingcontext.me, and she is in the know, looking from the outside in. So, Kenny, what more can you tell us about Therese, or should we just hop on in? Well, I'll just give you a quick preview of uh, my thoughts on it. Is that uh, Therese has an extensive background in multiple fields. So when she comes uh, onto the the show, she brings uh, information and intelligence and experience from multiple points of uh, our industry. So it's always a a great experience. Plus, she keeps us updated on Silicon Valley. Welcome to the show, Therese. Welcome, Therese. Thank you. Thanks for having me this morning. Um, it's always fun. Always fun to talk. Always a pleasure with us too. So listen, uh, you were, I think you covered your first control trends award. So, uh, last time I saw you two, you were in tuxedos (laughs) (laughs) and you were really running the show. That was a, that was a great night. I think you really found your groove year five, right? Year five. Year five. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you had the groove before, but that one was quite, I, just think it was a it, it was a great night. It, it had lots of energy. I think the energy of adding uh, the Bachnet awards 
inside was fun um, to have both those groups. And I got to run around and talk to people while you guys were um, orchestrating everything. And that well, we that, had some help. We had some help. We had uh, Rob Allen and uh, Michael Bonner and uh, Stacy McCammon also gave us that, that extra, uh, those all those tentacles to make that row that show go as uh, seamless as it did. That uh, thank you very much for saying that because I, I, any compliments we get about that always makes us smile. Well, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kimberly Brown, Kim Brown, right? Yeah. Oh, the MCs. Yeah. Well, they. Yeah. She does a great job up there with you too. I think that. Uh, her um you need, you need to sing her praises because she it, it, she's a natural she's sure is. Just a natural yeah, yeah. she and mark p talk together make it make it make a great story and and Therese, we want to thank you also you wrote a really really nice uh article sort of uh, your experience at the control trends award so we really appreciate that uh as usual you uh kind of have a way of capturing things with words that uh in writing that most people can't i think that's part of your gift and then also your perspective. So, uh, but it was, it was, it was big time. Kenny, I thought we hit on it. We, uh, we love, we finally got the women acknowledged in the industry and you were one of the, uh, the finalists for the woman of the year. So what, what was that, that piece like? Well, that was a super experience. It was funny. It was of course funny. Um, I know that some of the women have come back to you and said, we need a men of the year award next year. No, but nobody <laughs> said that to me. I'm afraid they think Kenny and I'll just take that one on. <laughs> we need a man of the word of year, but that's what we were, we were laughing amongst ourselves when we were up on that podium and everybody was clapping. We were kind of like, is this really, why isn't there a man of the year? But it was great. And the women up there were amazing. And it's fun how much I've gotten to, to for different reasons, know um, various of the, the women up there on the stage with me. Um, Jenny and Renee Joseph from, from JCI. Controls, yeah, uh, we've been talking about stuff. They, there's JCI um, has got a lot of things going on, also some Silicon Valley things going on. So it's it was fun to meet them face to face, and I think one of the really cool things that happened is I learned about the breakfast that was happening the next day. Um, so what you saw at Control Trends, like to wake up the next morning, was seven a.m in uh, the Caesar Hotel, a ballroom full of women. And it was so, there were so many ballrooms. I mean, HR is so vast that it fills all these hotels in Las Vegas. And you get into the Caesar and it's a maze and you're lost, but you find one ballroom, open the door, and it's overflow capacity of women um, talking about the women of AHR. And Renee, Joseph, and... Jenny, um, Jenny Stentz. Yep. Yeah, they, they were or, part of the organization of that. And there was a, you know, there's a lot to talk about. I don't know, we keep bringing in the Silicon Valley thing, but this week the news about Uber hit. where they, Oh, the sexual always, harassment they, thing, right? Yeah, they lose their women engineers. Oh, um, wow. And she was going through percentages, you know, this is why I left Uber. And when I was there, there was 14% women. Now there's like 6% women. Um, it, you know, we're just still evolving in that area. And certainly in, um, the tip, the classically male oriented field of building construction, um, design operations. And that's that breakfast the next morning was really, eye-opening for me and eye-opening and I lots of admiration for uh, Jenny and Renee. Well, well, say, 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 say more about that <laughs> out of the breakfast, Therese. Well, give us some of the key takeaways. What, what surprised you about that? Or what was what, some of the takeaways you had that you didn't expect from that breakfast meeting? Well, there was a certain, I mean, for the, uh, there was a professor that led it that was it's a in, I don't know what she, whether she was from Carnegie Mellon, but one of the big engineering schools. It was very ori oriented towards young women entering, starting out their their um, career in because we want all we want diversity in this industry. We want all the people. Yes. And so it was a professor that was leading it, and it was I think um, a distillation of a class about how to. Um, recognize that sometimes there's going to be problems in the workplace, what the best thing um, to do in those problems. And then there was a lot of story sharing about this happened, that happened. Women holding other women back too. Yeah. Um, 
that was discussed. It was and sure. kind of like the whole Uber thing this week in Silicon Valley. There were a little bit of tears, a little bit of, uh, um, I wish I had not dropped out. A lot of people wish that they had um, stuck with it and handled situations better instead of saying, well, I'm going to leave and, and and curtail my career at that company for well, I, 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 t I tell you, Teresa, it, it's you know, and and there was a book I, I read or heard about talking about you know how you know how vicious the workplace just is. I mean, it, you know, you think about the things that a lot of people do in the workplace is condoned, and um, uh, it's just uh, it, it's sort of nuts. And then on top of that, you compound the fact that you got the the, the sexes right, you know, the male and the female. It it just gets really complicated. So. Uh, but but I think Ken and I have very, very selfish reasons for, uh, you know, this is is we along with Ken Sinclair. And I think you have noticed that there's a shortage of, uh, of you know, qualified people in our industry. And, and with the demand that's coming about in our industry, we have to fill those shoes. So we're trying to attract young guns in. And of course, the women are absolutely one of the best resources we've got. And, you know, I mean, you got to know them. You, that stage right there, you talk to any of those women and they're dynamic, they're incredible. Jenny Stentz, for crying out loud, you know, is is one of the top executives on the planet in any field. And yet she's so accessible and she sort of brings that uh, a whole yeah. other dynamic to things. Yeah, 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 deservedly so. So so anyway, that was great. It was like the CTA Awards was like a segue into what I saw the next morning. And then I keep experiencing now I'm, um, met Kaba folks there and they asked me bringing in the Silicon Valley again the Kaba is having their um, forum in Santa Clara at actually the Intel campus it sounds like the same place um, IBCon was held yeah in part at there's so much uh challenge going on in the women thing that, uh, you know, because you're changing cultures and behavior and you got the corporate culture and then you have social culture. I have two daughters and I could tell you back when Title IX just came on board, how, how it was met with such contempt and, you know, because it affected the football programs building, uh, you know, the team building for the baseball programs, you know, and when you think about how much the contribution uh, of, of, a, of a family to a school district and the monies that are portioned, the girls certainly deserve their share of that budget, you know, so I remember going into arguments, or not arguments, fight, discussions, let's say, and it was such a challenge, but I was a father of two daughters going up against a father of two boys, you know? And so uh, I've seen it change a lot. It's, uh, America is an amazing place, but I don't think anywhere in the world you're going to see a, a fat, excuse me, a faster transition and acceptance and, and, uh, you know, parody. So I, I, I didn't get a chance to say that. Um, but going back yeah. to the, uh, Kappa thing, uh, Kappa is, I don't think people realize how extraordinarily big and important Kappa is and how much of a reach they have and how much good work they do. So, uh, exactly. Tell us about the event in Silicon Valley. Um, so they they do digital home as well as commercial building. Um, they have two tracks at the Kaaba event, and they bring together. I don't. I'm still at, on the outskirts of this. The panel I'm moderating actually is going to be one of our friends, Mark Pitak, and um, somebody. But it's going to be two other speakers. I can't remember their names. And um, it's going to be uh, both about data analytics and cybersecurity. Um, sure. So we got uh, Aglia good. Kong is a CTO for corporate networking, and Neil Tunmore, corporate vice president of uh, corporate services, and Matt Mayer, vice president of consumer experiences, are the keynote yeah. speakers. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's uh, <clears throat> it's a big topic around here, and I think that uh, in conjunction with the forum, they're having a um, a, a pitch fest. They're inviting, they've been, um, I know Albert, actually I helped Albert do a submission for the pitch fest, but there, any, any startup company that wants to present before the forum actually gets started. So I think it's the day before is the pitch fest. That's pretty that exciting. Yeah. A panel of judges, all the, um, startups have products in the building space and it's getting that energy going between the um, existing dominant big brand companies and all these startups that have ideas. All oh, where's the innovation going to come from? And the innovation comes from startups. So Kaba is one of those linking organizations that is facilitating that awesome. sort of meetup. So I think yeah. yeah, I think it's great, and that's I think the location in Silicon Valley. It's it's. Great to have it here. And of course, Intel is a big investor. I think, I don't know if you guys read the um, 
I think they say memory. I always say memory, but it's memory. Um, Jim McHale, his research firm, Jim's been writing some pieces about startups and how each of these big corporations are really their their venture investment arms are getting more active and realizing that they've got to invest in these startups if they want to jumpstart their own innovation. Um, so they want to meet them and understand them. And uh, it's it, it's it's just what's happening right now. Well, you know, Chase, uh, again, I, I feel like I'm going to put you in, in the reverse gear each time because um, that Startup Fest, I, I thought, you know, when you were saying uh, offline earlier about how it's incredible how th- that this is the new way. So I don't want to say it's disruptive, but I mean, I remember like crowdsourcing. The first time I heard that, I thought that's an amazing way to solve a problem or an amazing way for a corporation to get outside of its own limitations and, and its own barriers, you know, because they only see it from a different perspective. And there's a genius out there somewhere that sees their problem and offers something from the outside perspective that really was the, you know, it releases all that, uh, all that pent up opportunity uh, because it just, it came from a different unaffected source, you know, like instead of everything being internal, you get that external. Uh, so some very great thoughts on that. But um, the, the right, thing, and I, I think, I don't know, we were always talking about the books we're reading and this one I haven't read yet, but um, the one about just generally the big corporations have cut their R and D departments. Um, I think in the race in the quarter by quarter pressure to put shareholder results or shareholder value, these big corporations don't do the kind of internal R and D that they used to do. Um, right. Well, you're right. And, uh, plus now I think it's just the, uh, by the time they do that and there, there's turn cycles, two years, you know, from, from, th- from even when they say, okay, we want to build this, uh, starting tomorrow, by the time they get the first one out the door and on the shelves, it's, it's two years. So, uh, and then it's too late because the innovations going on with technology, it's like, uh, uh you know, the, the whole concept of Silicon Valley, you know, fail, fail, uh, often fail first and fail forward, but it's an iteration type of, of progress, not, a, a substantial uh, where a product's going to change and be a dominant product by itself. Again, it's Jim McHale who brought up Chris. Christensen, um, the author about Innovator's Dilemma, why the big corporations have trouble um, succeeding in innovation. And one of them is they you know nobody wants to eat. Um, they're, they're eating their own lunch. Somebody their else eats you. Food. You're expecting somebody else to come in. And when they get these new ideas get squelched internally because you're stepping on somebody's toes internally. You're, uh, so you, right. that's the, that book, Innovator's Dilemma, and and they're growing beyond that. I, I think here, another Valley event is, um, in the last two years, since the Johnson-Tyco merger, um, Tyco had what they called the Tyco Innovation Garage. Now they've got the JCI Tyco, I don't know what they're going to call it yet, but it's still the Innovation Garage here, um, which is sort of full-time running uh, pitch fests and um, looking for startups, uh, beating the bushes for, for things that are going to work. And of course, Tyco expands it out to security, fire, um, and physical security, um, fire prevention, and all the kind of Internet of Things things that Tyco is involved in. And I think Jenny is big in that area of trying to make the merger work. And um, I think where the rubber meets the road is in this Internet of Things startup area. Um, Agreed. So, well, what uh, you have an article coming up, I, I believe, for uh, the March edition of uh, Automated Buildings. What's that? Uh, what's the theme there? Yeah, I um, actually, I'm I got an interview with Alper. I've done a couple things for March, um, February. Uh, before we pass up, uh, into March, February, my article um, was it, it sort of, it sort of surprises me when I put these things out, um, but it was a top read. Uh, for February by by a wide margin, and I kind of keyed off Seinfeld and the idea of uh, that funny labeling um, uh, labeling um, episode, and this the topic of labeling and the topic of how that relates to machine learning. Um, that was a I, I think it was really well accepted because it presented that topic pretty simply, but it is really when you're talking about moving from where we are now into the era of machine learning, everything's got to get meta, metadata tagged. 
And I think we <laughs> understand it, but I don't think we understand yet how important it is. Um, that was very good. Yeah, I, 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 in fact, if you say the first, uh, one of the most rewatched episodes of the comedy series Seinfeld, Label Maker, when Elaine's gift to a friend at Christmas was to re-gifted uh, to Jerry before the Super Bowl. So, uh, but yeah, that's a great, that's a great comment. Uh, Teresa, that's why I think uh, Eric and I really believe that you have that, that incredible insight from them. Uh, tell people about your background real quick. Uh, just uh, what, real quick, give us the 411 where, Therese, where'd you get all this profound knowledge? Well, one thing in my background, because it really is it, um, state of the art now, is I came from a, a company I did uh, up in Oregon called Mentor Graphics, which Siemens just bought. And what Mentor Graphics does, and this is like in the 80s, 90s, I worked, and I worked actually in Paris um, for Mentor Graphics. And what they do, um, the category is called electronic design automation, but it's systems on a chip design. They do the software for, um, and especially this was so important in the 80s, for designing the circuit boards and um basically manipulating polygons uh, on a on a screen because wires had become, um, you know, you used to be able to breadboard things and put, when you wanted to do a circuit board, literally a breadboard and put wires and chips. And that became impossible with micro things getting smaller in the 80s. So you had to do it all on screen with geometric polygons to say where the ele electrons are going to travel. So they be basically, that's what electronic design automation is. One half, um, the computer aided design, the other half simulation. Well, all sure. that technology is becoming so important to our industry now. Whereas in the eighties and nineties, I was talking about how to simulate what was going on in a computer tower today. That same thinking is going on how to simulate what's going on inside an office tower. Um, Neat. but the software is the same and I really see the same patterns. Um, all Alper stuff, visualization, um, which that was great. Those awards that went out CTAs for, for Alper and the Digilogic folks about visualization. Well, things have gotten just like in microelectronics, things got too complicated to think about on a breadboard. Now things have gotten in buildings also too complicated to think about in our own heads. And we have we need visualizations. We need to be able to simulate um, and predict what's going on, and we need software tools for that. Hey, Teresa, so that's why I, I get um, a lot of insight is because I've been through one round of this. Well, um, hey, Teresa, uh, you know Eric here again. Uh, you know, so I'm wondering with all this stuff, all these great tools we're getting, and this is more of a philosophical question, and we're going to wax philosophical here for a minute. But, uh, you know, our kids, are my kids, kids even going to be able to write? You know, I mean, now we're going to, uh, you know, voice commands. You know, Ken Sinclair talked about, you know, the using of voice commands. We got the visualization. We got the data. And then, you know, we're going to connect those things together where the thinking is done for us. What is that going to do to us as, an, as a species as we evolve? I, I know this is getting a bit off topic, but with your wide background, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. I, um, I guess I think we need to keep. Um, maybe it's where I am right now. I'm actually right now. We just got a new puppy, and I consider my the, the puppy, and it's a husky. Um, my new teacher, the puppy is my new teacher. Is get back into your own senses. Watch his ears perk up. Watch when he just shakes things off. He has a little. He meets another dog on the street. He has a little, and then he just shakes it off. You know his his instincts, his physicalness. I'm just like, oh, let's not forget how to do that. Because, um, you know, our brain is just some meat between our ears. <laughs> With a little electricity there. We don't, want, yeah, we, don't want to, we don't want to forget the rest of our senses. So, well, yeah, but 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 it but it is kind of an, and again, it, it, to me, it's a germane topic because you know, as Paul Oswald talks about a lot, you know, the the tribal knowledge is leaving the building, and it's being replaced with, like you say, these great technological advances, but. There, there was a um, a woman I listened to on a podcast with Tim Ferriss. I don't know if you ever check him out or not, but a uh, brilliant woman. I was trying to find her name. I can't remember, but she was talking about sort of this same question to a degree that, uh, you know, she's in her 50s, I think she said. And she said she remembered for the first time when she grew up, you know, her mom began to cook meals from 
uh, a box and a can, which was sort of unheard of. But, you know, and, and the fallout for that is, you know, arguably uh, most of us are kind of more unhealthy than we've ever been. Right. It's to sort of you could be argued that it's sort of destroyed agriculture and all these other uh, other sort of things. So I, I guess what I'm the question I'm sort of posing is, um how do we strike a balance or can we strike a balance or is this just an inevitability? We're going to go down this path and like I say, a hundred years from now, if our kids can't read or write or think it's okay because the, you know, the, the machines are going to be there and hopefully we'll still have puppies or unless they're little puppy robots, right? <laughs> little puppy robots <laughs> to be our teachers. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. We've only got the next generation. I think we're all involved in the next generation. I'm back to the woman thing that I have a daughter and uh, she's super interested in, in fact, she's studying uh, in a track uh, for facilities, the next generation facilities management, energy management. And um, I have, I think she's going to have a wonderful life. It has to happen that we, get people and that understand this, but I, there's a, a physicalness and an artness of it too. And I was trying to, another thing I really want to thank you for is um, capturing that session. Uh, Ken's great session. session. Yeah, yeah. It was a really great session for you to be in. And I felt like there was a strong um, connection between the CTA awards and that session that people up there were really relaxed. Um, the funny back and forth between John Petsy and um, Andy McMillan Andy yeah. McMillan was uh, it, it reminded me of seeing Andy up on the stage at the CTAs. He was just like really relaxed and in a comfortable place and just like, let's really talk about this. And uh, yeah. we did get into this subject that you're bringing up now, Eric, of the human factors. And I did bring up my daughter again. You did. About, um, because there has to be that human factor. We all have to take the dogs as our teachers and and be feeling and physical to understand how to use those all that technology, all these LED lights, you know, it's not just technology, it's technology interfacing well, with know, people. I, and on top of that, I like part of Oswald's comment. He interjected that, you know, is that really a, a facility manager or building automation responsibility to change human behavior and everything? Because remember, we got into ethics, but um, he said we can barely keep the buildings running. And now we're going to try to, you know, uh, go into a, a, a metric where we're 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 at measuring comfort and, and uh, how well people are productive inside of a space. But that was a heck of a have, heck of a council or a, whatever you'd call a board there yeah. of minds from different directions, but uh, great interjections. Yeah. And what about the ethics, uh, Therese? How, how, what's the thin line between uh, will you volunteer your information and your data and, and when it's taken from you and then you're the product. I mean, as we get this innovation, where, where's the governors of, you know, uh, of our morals and, and our, and our uh, privacies. Uh, how, how do you, how do you interlace all those considerations in with all this great innovation and everything we've talked about previously? Who's, I, who's, I who's sent who's I, the day after I sent around and I don't know if I included you guys on, I'll find it, but there's actually a um, ethics in buildings um, consortium organization that's been launched in Europe to just focus on the ethical question that was, what that was brought up. Um, I think again, right now we're, we've got the technology, the technology has run ahead of our ability to, to think through those problems. And I don't think that we're the, that the technician putting it, you know, installing the lights or designing the control system, it's, it's. Not in, uh -huh. in this scope right now. Well, Teresa, I, I think, and I think that's where I think you are so important to our industry because you have a context that's outside of the industry. I think, you know, we as an industry tend to be hyper-focused as we probably should be on the, the next great technology, making the buildings more efficient, uh, you know, and, and I think, you know, having people be more productive in buildings, I think is ethically okay. When it has me buy stuff I don't need, I think that's where the, the ethics line gets drawn. So I, I, for one, am looking for you to, uh, to, to continue to sort of, uh, you know, bring that outside looking in context, put it in a bigger context, because everything in life has its, you know, effects, both positive and negative. And no matter how good technology is and how, how, how much more efficient we get, there is a cost 
to that. So, uh, so again, I, I think our industry is really, really lucky to have you uh, in our industry because, again, like Kenny said, from your perspective from the outside, so I, I encourage you to keep asking those tough questions and, and, and keep those on our, you know, on the, the front burners of our minds. And, and I think, you know, Ken Sinclair is another one that does that. And I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Did, did we surprise him in inducting him to the Hall of Fame? Was that a surprise? That was a big surprise. That was so much fun to see him surprised. It doesn't happen yeah. often, does it? <laughs> no. no. And the piece he wrote, I mean, Kenny was trying to be, get to get me to go to March. And March is great. I love um because I do a great interview with Albert. I hope everybody reads that. I did, a, a, in the background, a piece with DLR Group, so that closing the loop between the specifying engineers and the control people, I, I think that's that's a good one. But Ken has let slip through, because um, he's got now, uh, he works with Penton, he, he, he's always worked with um, engineering systems to get his pieces out a little bit early. And he... Uh, the piece he did for Contractor Magazine, I think it's his best writing yet about this pe people piece. Um, and you know where he is right now? He's skiing. Good he for said, him. <laughs> it's like the week. It's the weekend before. He's so chill. Like it's the weekend before because it's a short month. February. The issue is due out. He's got it all. He and Jane have it all in the bag, and he's with his granddaughter and daughter skiing. So well, we make no bones Ken about. We make, we make no no bones about the fact, Teresa, that Ken Sinclair is one of our, our favorite people. We consider him a mentor. Like you, we consider him uh, the industry lucky to have yeah. him. So uh, there, it couldn't be a more deserving guy to get in the Hall of Fame. And, and Kenny, I, I think I speak for you. If it, That's going to be one of our all-time highlights with, uh, with, with Ken Sinclair getting surprised and inducted in the Hall of Fame with his good, good friend. Jack McGowan, you know, and that, that was what really worked out because Ken has such an affinity for Jack McGowan and it was so well, heartfelt. McGowan, his like, he too, he's writing another book. Oh, well, I'm going to step back a little bit, but I'm right. You know, he's, he's got another book he's working on and um, he's just, you got to look up to these guys that they're thriving and contributing. Yeah. Best ever. Yep, yeah, boy, you know, and we, we, you know, Ken Sinclair is an official young gun, too, so he's got the trophy and everything. So uh, proving that young gun is not an age, it's, it, it, it's a mentality. So, wow, Therese, well, so what else we got, Kenny? Well, I, I think we covered uh, a lot of it, and we just have to do this more often because, uh, again, I, I think for the listener, if we if uh, if people hear this, they're going to hear just a, a you know this isn't all just HVAC and dry nuts building automation. This is uh, the world around us, and, and I think uh, Therese, one of the first lessons or explanations that you really uh, gave a, a uh, you know an in depth. Uh, understanding was context and what it means like when you you did that snowball piece a couple of christmases ago about what it meant you go into a store and your smart device connects to the the uh the device inside the stores it's monitoring activity and people and then it, it just starts to steer you into uh, you know a, 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 an experience so the user experience thing was the next thing that came out of context in other words we have technology it's deployed it's in every house now the context is what it does to change your life so if you have a if you have wireless in your house now you can add your smart TV, your smart lights, your smart garage door opener, and that that is contextualization. And I think that was a great explanation. So well, hang on, I, I want I want to I want to hop in and, and and add to that definition of contextualization, uh, Therese, and see if you agree with this vis-a-vis -vis our conversation. You, Kenny, and I are all old enough to remember a book called Megatrends by a guy named John Nesbitt back in the day, and where he predicted all these great technology sort of boons. And uh, but but one of the things he said is the more we got more high tech, the high more touch. you needed high touch, right? Which mm -hmm. was sort of that human element that we're talking about. So 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 I sort of bring that up because I think that has got to be part of the context of uh, of of technology, which is you know again, Ken Sinclair, you know, is addressing it, and you're addressing it, and and we're addressing it, and and I think you know to me a great example of a company that maybe sort of gets the concept of high touch and high tech, and I want to get your opinion on this would be Comfy. And uh, Kenny, real quick, before Therese responds to that, give people the 411 on what Comfy is. And then Therese, I'd like to get your comments vis-a-vis uh, -vis if you think Comfy is one of those companies that's sort of bridging the high-touch, high-tech. Because I think that might be the differentiator going forward as we get more and more down the road technology-wise is, is, is how can you have great technology, but at the same time a high-touch sort of component to it. 
Well, my experience was with Lindsey Baker. I was fortunate enough with the RealCom IBCon to be uh, a moderator on uh, two panels, and I got to meet Lindsey Baker, and she explained what uh, what Comfy was all about, and uh, about smart sensors and how human beings now, uh, instead of trying to heat the space and heat the environment, make the person in that space comfortable and get a direct relationship. So they feel like, uh, you know, gone are the days of placebo thermostats and, and this, this, this detachment about, you know, there's a system out there that I'm not related to and they don't care if I'm hot or cold. And that turns into a brutal person in a relationship. And they don't know it's not as productive. Well, Lindsay made that quite clear that if you give those people an opportunity to interface directly with their phone, I want heat or I want cooling or I'm comfy, then you've got the best zoning system in the world. You've got happy, productive people and you got the most efficient energy saving systems available. Well, it's, it's high touch, right? Just the name comfy is a high touch sort of thing. So absolutely. Yeah. There's a setup, Therese. Take that ball and run yeah, with it. I, I agree. I think that comfy is, um, they have brought that piece. And I know that Lindsay came from um, Berkeley, where she did a lot of studies of um, occupancy, post a post-occupancy surveying of how um, people felt in their buildings. Did a lot of K through 12 work um, to understand how children um, felt in their learning environments and teachers. And when you have, and was able to break it down and, and quantify stuff, breaking it, breaking it down into how do you feel thermally? How do you feel acoustically? Um, how do you feel the way the layout works in, you know, I imagine, you know, very, very first Lindsay, it, it was about how the, the layout of the classroom, how all that was going to affect learning. Um, as Ken talks about, this is mushy stuff. It's hard to get at. But Lindsay was one of those people working at getting at it. And I, I think she's still working at it. And I think it's it's great. I think, yeah. Well, I think you have to work um, out the economics because even though the idea is great, you know, you still got to put that into a, you know, you got to sell it and monetize it. And I think that's where the issues are is that even though we all agree that that is a great way to do it and it's a great solution, now how do we pay for it? And I think that's where their challenges are coming is how to how to get incentivized, how to be rewarded for making that investment. And that's through occupancy. You know, that's through people staying in long term yeah. real estate. So yeah. Right, right. I hate, to, I hate to come and say, well, can I, I want another swat at this, but um, I do want another swat at it. Take another uh, swat. <laughs> at <laughs> what Ken, Ken's article which is great. He's always a young guy because he's bringing up Alexa, the voice entry, um, the Google Assistant, how we're how we're going to interface with our buildings differently. And my labeling article, which set kind of set that up for um, in February, is that all these things that I seem to be rushing ahead so quickly, um, the uh, but what the CCTV cameras do, the um, visualization analytics, the, uh, the voice analytics, um, they're just frosting on the cake. Once you get the labeling, once you get the metadata, you can do that kind of, you can enable Alexa. You can eventually enable Comfy to get better and better. Um, but you need you need that labeling. Um, gotcha. To, to get there. So I think yeah, but, 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 taste that, out in the future <laughs> in this area of how the, how the buildings are going to be. But, but, I, but I love the fact that you definitely defined uh, in very precise terms what high touch is. It's the mushy stuff that's hard to define. <laughs> and the article actually is giving me another pitch for my March article, which comes from DLR group, um, big um, recognized out of Chicago, but they're all over the place. Um, MEP firm is how they try to predict in the beginning um, performance of a building at the, before an architect puts pen to, pen, um, to paper, try, trying to get at that mushy stuff. The architects try to do that. Um, and then at the back end, um, so they have a lot of input on the front end thinking about comfort and how the user is actually going to use the space. There's a lot of thought that goes in. And they talk about that. But then at the back end of that um, build construct cycle is the um, phase of uh, functional test. Is it doing what we're supposed to do? And where Lindsay was before post occupancy surveying, which happens right after when, you know, six months after the, the people are in the building, how is this working out? And that's too when you, um, a DLR group has, uh, and they're working with familiar brands we know in analytics 
to uh, to test that out at the at the end. And how is the control programming um, working out in terms of heating, um, lighting, and getting that back again to the the feedback for the next project they're working on. So those decisions we made really early in the design process, how did those decisions work out? The MEP firms are trying to get that full cycle, but we're early days. Sure, sure. Well, I tell you, you've got a good future. That's why uh, Eric once said that uh, if you're a building owner, this is a great time to be in the business because finally uh, you're going to be able to get that predictive, uh, predictability or forecasting how good your building is so that you can measure metrically if you invest this much money, this is what you're going to get. If you invest this much money, this is what you're going to get. And then they can they can opt how they fund their building and then expect the performance and then have the commissioning tools and the provisioning tools. And like you just said, the the surveying, the fun, you know, function testing to verify that things were done right and then move forward. So I think I think we got an exciting industry. I think the innovation, everything we see coming at it is only going to improve it, but it's going to disrupt people. So all the people that are in their sweet spots and they don't want to, like Ken St. Clair, they don't want to, you know, it's either move or groove or get out of the way, you know, so – uh, we got a really exciting future. So well, I'm looking forward to the next time to see Therese. Yeah, absolutely. Therese, where are we going to see you next? What's your next conference? Well, my next conference is um, certainly Santa Clara um, Caba Forum. And then I hope to get to Tampa and Hastings. Yeah. I hope to get to San Diego and Ibicon. Very, very cool. All right. Well, listen, Therese, we got to hop off, but thank you so much. We've been get, we've been talking, and our guest this week has been Therese Sullivan from BuildingContext.me. Go check her blog out. She's one of the great thought leaders in our industry. So, Therese, thanks for taking some time to, to speak with us today. Well, you're welcome. It's always great. It's always fun. So great stuff from Therese, Kenny, uh, as always, man, one of my favorite people in the industry. And let's get back to our highlight reel. We had uh, the 2016 Control Trends Variable Frequency Drive of the Year, and uh, I thought it was a cool, another cool video. And tell us a little about the BT300. Well, you know, the BT300, uh, you know, it's the second year in a row that uh, it's won. And I think the reason why is that uh, it provides, uh, you know, everybody's got a great VFD, I think. Uh, it's hard to say it, uh, but and because, you know, it's such a... You know, what is what are you saying when everybody's got a good one? Well, they all do. Every manufacturer that I've I've worked with, whether it's A, B, and B, Graham, uh, Dunfoss, Danfoss, you know, Johnson certainly is a good VSD line. But um, you got to make things special, and they have to be affordable, and they have to have the the benefits of uh, you, know, you know what differentiates. Well, I think the the BT three hundred has taken steps to become the most friendly. Uh, you know, VFD to uh, deploy, to uh, to put in, to service, and it has to be price effective. And I think these guys have got some kind of a formula that's delivering that because, uh, you know, yeah, well, Kenny, well, Kenny, I want to just hop in real quick. You know, we were talking to Reese about, you know, the high tech, high touch. I think you could argue that the Siemens interface is is really sort of got that high touch sort of feel to it. And, and, and I think that's the, the differentiator, you know, is how you interface with it. Uh, to me, uh, that's one of the things I think they're, they're, they're spot on with it. Yeah, well, I think the um, it has to be easy. It has to be. Uh, it has to work. It has to be dependable. It has to have a minimum. You know, the, the warranties. You know, because everybody's just throwing such good numbers out there. Uh, I think with the the BT three hundred, for instance, what you could do is you can control two PID uh, loops. In other words, you can control a heating valve and a cooling valve without adding I/O to your network. You can actually use a VFD now to do you know uh, one or two uh, inputs. Uh, you know, to control. Uh, a heating valve and a cooling valve. So for the people that are really good at the uh, applications, that means that they can save money because they know they've got two additional, uh, you know, uh, outputs from a VFD that, you know, if you don't know that and you don't put that to use, uh, then you're not, you're not exploiting that. But the, what, what, What's happening in our industry is people in the know going to the training, getting certified, having that experience. They just know that that's a, it's a, it's already something they can use, and it just saves them time, energy, and money. You know, but uh, there we see the uh, Siemens guys. We have Josh Felpern holding the trophy. We have Scott Hamilton in the middle. I'm not sure what the gentleman's name is on the left, and uh, but what a great picture this is. This is like rock stars, right? You know, these guys are young, vibrant, and they're excited that they won. And it's always another really pleasing aspect is to see genuine. You know, it's because it's so competitive. You know, they didn't. Uh, they they were happy that they won. Just like uh, you see somebody sitting in the in the uh, audience with bated breath, waiting to see who got movie of the year or whatever. Uh, and so I like to make that kind of analogy because in our industry, this is uh, this is what it does. This is uh, the Control Trends Awards really and truly give people a moment of excitement in an audience in, in a very celebrated environment, and then being picked by the uh, Control Trends community. Uh, that's got to be a super feeling of elation. 
Well, I think it is. And, of course, Seaman's got those young execs we've been talking about. Josh Felburn's one of the great guys. He call, He's called on us before in the past as our sales rep. And just so nice to see Josh doing so well and that whole team at Seaman. So the other thing we do, Kenny, is, is, is if you have a press release – and this is true for anybody in our industry. Any press releases you want us to post on Control Trends, we will. We received uh, a press release from Contemporary Controls, which we posted, mm-hmm. and uh, kind of a very, very cool, po- cool press release that they had uh, announcing, among other things, that they were the Control Trends Vendor of the Year, Small Manufacturer, in addition to winning the Peripheral Product of the Year, Best Technical Support Company, Small Manufacturer. So, uh, very cool, well, yeah. very cool post. I, again, these guys are so proud of, of how hard they work, uh, and and you know, and then to get recognized for that is such a good pat on the back for you know great organizations. Uh, you know, we we we've seen the um, oh just just uh, from all over the world. Uh, you know, like EasyIO when uh, you know it, it, they're so amazed that uh, you know people are paying attention to all the hard work they do and 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 the gains they've been making. That when they see this, they have a. Uh, um, a little, uh, again, they have they know that all that trench work that they're doing is appreciated. All that support work that they're doing, uh, that the people really and truly, when you get a chance to recognize them for being the best technical supporter, best manufacturer of the year, and those peripheral products that everybody just takes so for granted, the routers that with the IP to MSTP, and it just it's just really cool to see a company that's been around doing things so well for so long get some attention. So uh, congratulations to George Thomas and, and those guys. Uh, Apologize to George. He had a bad view. I think <laughs> he got. To, he was very generous to the group that was sitting with him. He got the chair that had the pole in front of him, so he didn't have a, a good shot on stage. So we apologize, George. Won't happen again. But um, that was good I, stuff. I, it's fun well, to work with. Yeah, it's fun to work with them. And and again, you know, part of the Control Trends Awards, what we learned from every single one of them. this one, we had the biggest crowd we ever had. So. Uh, we we try to do a Southwest style seating. We're going to change that up. So again, that won't happen again. But but it's a good problem to have. And Kenny, speaking of uh, you know great products, innovative products. Uh, you know, a relative newcomer to the control trends community is Distech Controls. Our friend Dan Flaherty, when he went over to Distech, the first thing he did was bring Martin Velu News into for an interview. Distech was very big, uh, very prominent at the Control Trends Awards this year, and we'll we'll get more posts on their awards, but you had a chance to catch up with them at AHR and catch up with their product line. So tell us about what you thought about the Distech product offering. Yeah, well, I, I, uh, I gotta tell you that uh, I've been doing this for over 30 years and, uh, I always like that. I have two sides of me. I've ever like a right, right hemisphere and left hemisphere. So one is the one that's uh, always frightened and despaired and, and looks at disruption as a bad thing. And yet, like Ken St. Clair says, you know, the right side of me looks at this and says, where has this been? This is a great thing. Uh, the iPhone, you know, I, I, at one time, I'm sure I said, I'm not, I'm not interested. You know, I don't want it. But now this thing's indispensable. Well, when people were able to do that on a grand scale, you know, global scale, where you take attributes of great companies and you synergize them, uh, you really truly are doing something special. And then when you create the uh, deployment schemes for the new technology on a building scale, on a, on a, on a grand scale like that, uh, then you're taking a look at what's going on at the Acuity Distech booths. Because uh, Ryan was very excited to tell us about what Acuity has done for Distech. Distech uh, was a great control company on its own accord, but it probably didn't have the level of uh, funding and the level of uh, technical support that Acuity's uh, you know, prominence brought to them. So now, they, instead of developing one product, they're developing a product platform at a time, and they're really putting the IoT together. So uh, Distech uh, showed us uh, their their commitment to this technology through the uh, you know at this show they had a booth that was one of a kind uh, just full of technology uh, the we got a chance to meet uh, the high ranking acuity CEO I believe uh, and he he told us about his commitment uh, his personal commitment you know and his professional commitment of what they're going to do but the end result is that the people that work uh, and, and deploy the acuity uh, lighting concept using this tech components visualized through DG logic are going to have a very very uh, you know you're going to have the state of the art highest form of technology uh, at your fingertips and it's going to be great for the environment they're very much into green leads 
they're into all those compliance things, and they're setting the pace for the integration of technology using wireless, using the uh, some of the more forward uh, concepts of IoT that we know with uh, anything from the different spaces with lighting being the first stage of cooling and heating, uh, the enhancement for, like you said, retail purchasing. You know, the lighting shades are all relevant to people's dispositions and influence people to make a move to excite them or to, uh, you know, interest them. All the way down to uh, enhancing uh, inside of a classroom, the optimal lighting schemes and schematic or schema, whatever they pick to choose to explain that, is enhanced at the, at the beginning of school, uh, during lunch period, after lunch. Uh, it can actually affect behavior all the way to uh, reducing uh, healing times after you get hurt uh, in the hospital, have an operation, or you deal uh, with some kind of a serious uh, affliction or, or you know operation. The fact that you see so many uh, changes in the light and dark, light and dark, can give you the concept that so much time has elapsed. And you should be better in 10 days. And those 10 days are actually eight because they messed around with the lighting a little bit to think you that uh, like with chickens, they're hatching uh, instead of every 24 hours, they get them to, to lay eggs every 18 hours, you know, so they save that many hours per year. Now, that's a whole different ethical thing. But uh, for people having a this tech being able to give you uh, optimal comfort, optimal energy, optimal lighting. Yeah, I I think it gets back to this whole high touch thing we're talking about. You know, we talked about with Therese, maybe the differentiator is your high touch and be able to integrate the controls with the lighting, because obviously lighting is is such a key component to how we feel psychologically. And there are all kinds of studies on that. And we also talked about, you know, a couple weeks ago on the show, we talked about how sound, how controlling the white or the pink noise and sound also has effect on, on productivity. So it's kind of cool that Acuity is bringing these components together and then getting the analytics with our friends from DG Logic. So it seems like they have a very, very comprehensive uh, package there. But I got to tell you, Kenny, I'm, I'm not so sure about this psychological lighting thing because I tell you what, I went and bought the Philips things, you know, with the different colored light bulbs and you can create the different sort of uh, moods and so on and so forth. So maybe somebody from Acuity can help me with this because. Uh, you know, I put the lights up in the bedroom and I play with every color combination possible, dude. And I'm still in the doghouse. So uh, I, I don't know, man. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I think uh, give it time. It'll be uh, it, it's going to work for you in, in the near future. I got a feeling, Eric. Yeah, OK, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep at it there. But uh, but I, I sort of say that in jest, but it is it is a fascinating, fascinating topic. So, Kenny Smyers, I tell you what, we've been we've been running a long time today and I know you probably you're uh, not feeling all that great really appreciate you soldiering on with the eye so uh, what, do, what do you got planned later on the day you're gonna take some more pain pills and get some rest yeah i'll be working on uh, different things i always got things to do in the office but uh yeah you can lay under a rock and cry about it or you can uh, just press on i'm pressing on so uh yeah, I'm, not, I'm not happy but uh well i'll oh, tell you well. what you know it, it's interesting because it's your left eye i mean your right eye that got your left eye that got hurt right Right. And then my right eye had a problem with that last year. So my right eye is kind of fuzzy. Your left eye is kind of fuzzy. But between the two of us, buddy, we got 2020 vision, right? We, we got clarity. Yeah, yeah baby. Clarity. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, Kenny, we're going to hop off. So with that, a special, special thanks to our guest this week, Therese Sullivan from buildingcontext.me. Be sure to check her out. Uh, a special thanks to the man, the myth, the legend for soldiering on because I know he's uncomfortable and in a lot of pain. But, uh, Kenny, thanks for that. So with that, our Control Trends Committee, thanks for tuning in. Remember, be bold, stay in control. Indeed, Eric. Indeed, Kenny Smiley. All right, buddy, there we go.